Hello, I'm Father James Kubicki, the National Director of the Apostleship of Prayer, and we've come to the last of our series on the book that I wrote called Rediscovering Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, A Heart on Fire. And with this final video, we come to chapter 9, a chapter that's entitled Loving with the Sacred Heart of Jesus. That was the goal of my book, and I hope that this little series and praying and speaking and discussing my book has helped you to love more strongly with the heart of Jesus, that your heart and his heart are beating more closely together so that as you live your daily life, you are loving with the heart of Jesus, that your two hearts beat as one. That's what Sacred Heart Devotion is really all about, isn't it? Recall that as we talked about my book, we said that devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is not so much a devotion of ours as it is God's devotion. It's God's devotion to us and our response to that devotion. So it's our response to God's devoted love to us, for us, and our response of a devoted love to God. The more we know this love of God, we've said, the more we will want to respond. And the more we know God's devotion to us, the more our own devotion will deepen and catch fire and be more fervent. We also emphasize that Sacred Heart devotion is not one devotion among many, but the devotion of the church because it's about the Eucharist. Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary and other saints always in the context of the Blessed Sacrament. And our devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is directly related to the Eucharist. When Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary, he asked her for a feast of reparation, a feast that would make up for the coldness with which many people treated him in the Eucharist, ignoring him, treating him with irreverence, really not appreciating the gift that we have in the Eucharist and what Jesus did for us. And so the Feast of the Sacred Heart, Jesus asked for that feast as a feast of reparation to be celebrated right after the Feast of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the Eucharist. This devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus helps us to celebrate the Eucharist with a more active participation, where we're not just participating physically, present, kneeling, sitting, standing, responding, singing, but that our hearts and our minds are engaged, that we're on fire with love for God. Remember Luke chapter 24, the story of Jesus appearing to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And the first part talks about how Jesus explained the scriptures to them. And later they said, did not our hearts burn as he told us the scriptures and connected them to Jesus? And then they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And that, we said, word and sacrament or sacrifice is the Mass, the Eucharist. And to help us enter more deeply into the word, we said, we should try to enter into the heart of Jesus so that when we read the scriptures, we are thinking not only what did Jesus do, and we not only try to experience the stories, but we also want to go deeper into the heart of Jesus and ask ourselves, what was moving the heart of Jesus? What were the values and attitudes that he had? Because this is what we want. We want to have our hearts transformed so that we think and feel with the heart of Jesus. And then when we come to the second part of the Eucharist, the sacrifice, the sacrament, we said that this was a fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 11 and chapter 36, where speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, God made that great promise, I will take from your bodies your stony, hard hearts these hearts that are hardened by sin, and I will give you natural, human, loving hearts. And we ask, when was that ever fulfilled? Not until Jesus. Whose heart was that heart that God wants every human person to have, a natural, human, loving heart made in the image and likeness of God himself, like the heart of God. And Jesus 
in the Eucharist, when we receive him in Holy Communion, he comes to us body, blood, soul, and divinity, including his heart. And it's there that our hearts can be transformed by his heart so that we not only take on his attitudes and feelings, but we actually have a new heart that transforms our hearts. And then we said, as we go forth from mass, we live with those hearts transformed. And this is what the final chapter speaks about, living with the sacred heart of Jesus, loving with the sacred heart of Jesus, loving others with his heart. This chapter, I think, could be updated by some of the things that Pope Francis has said in the last year, couple years. And that's what I'd like to do now. As I wrote that final chapter, I talked about Pope Pius XII and his encyclical on the Eucharist. I talked about Pope Benedict. And now I'd like to talk about Pope Francis. There's the expression, building the civilization of love. This is an expression that St. John Paul used, Pope Benedict picked up on, and we could see in the writings of Pope Francis that we're called to build the civilization of love against a culture of death. But the way we can build this civilization of love is only if our hearts are transformed. So again, this devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is not something individualistic, but that draws us to communion with one another. As we enter the heart of Jesus more deeply and have our hearts transformed, we also have our relationships with others transformed, and we enter into a deeper communion of saints, the Church, the Body of Christ. Pope Francis this year, 2015, wrote a message for World Youth Day. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, World Youth Day in Krakow, Poland, that's going to be 2016. But every year, World Youth Day is celebrated, not always internationally, as we will do in 2016, but it's celebrated also in the diocese on Palm Sunday every year. And this year, we had the 30th celebration, the 30th year of World Youth Day celebrations. In his message to the young people and to all people, Pope Francis talked about a particular beatitude. He's focusing on the beatitudes as we're preparing for World Youth Day in Krakow, Poland. And in his message this year, he takes the beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He begins by reflecting on this word blessed, another expression uh, or translation of this beatus is happy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And in his first part of this message, he talks about happiness, how we're made, human beings are made for happiness. Unfortunately, from the beginning, from our ancestral parents of Adam and Eve, human beings have thought they knew better what happiness is and how it can be found. We've gone off on our own. Here's what Pope Francis says about the heart, because blessed, happy are the pure in heart. And he says this, let us now try to understand more fully how this blessedness comes through purity of heart. First of all, we need to appreciate the biblical meaning of the word heart. And again, in my book, I talk about this. Pope Benedict has talked about this. When we talk about the heart, we're speaking of more than the physical organ. He said, in Hebrew thought, the heart is the center of the emotions, thoughts, and intentions of the human person. Since the Bible teaches us that God does not look to appearances, external physical appearance, but to the heart, and we see that in 1 Samuel chapter 16, where God chooses David to be the new king, and everybody thinks, well, why are you choosing this boy? There are stronger brothers of David that could be chosen, and this is where um, the prophet Samuel says, uh, God doesn't look at the physical, physical appearance, he reads the heart 
He goes deeper. And so, since God does not look at appearances but into the heart, we can also say that it is from the heart that we see God. It's through the heart that we see God. Remember, again, we have, we've said that we don't encounter God so much by thinking, by thinking about God, trying to prove God's existence. Because God is a mystery beyond anything we could understand. And so we have to go deeper. We go to the heart, which is the place of wisdom. Pope Francis goes on, he says, this is because the heart is really the human being in his or her totality as a unity of body and soul in his or her ability to love and be loved. We only truly come to know another person, as Pope Benedict said, with the heart. And it's through love that we come to know another. So it is with the heart that we come to know another. Then Pope Francis goes on to talk about how purity is not so much ritual purity, the way the Pharisees thought about it, washing the hands before the worship and things like that. But he says, quoting Jesus, that it's what comes out of the heart that makes one clean or unclean. And it's in the heart that we have evil thoughts, or we could say good thoughts. And so purity of heart means following these inspirations of God that lead to eternal life. St. Catherine of Siena said, all the way to heaven is heaven. And so as we prepare to have these pure hearts that will see God, we experience the happiness of heaven even now here on earth as we live with purity of heart. Then Pope Francis goes on to say this, the greatest good we can have in life is our relationship with God. And then he asks the young people in his message, are you convinced of this? Do you realize how much you are worth in the eyes of God? Do you know that you are loved and welcomed by him unconditionally, as indeed you are? I heard it put this way once, that there's nothing we can do that would make God love us less. And there's nothing we can do that would make God love us more. Because God is infinite love. And there's no more or less about infinite love or infinity. And God loves each individual as though that person were the only person who is the recipient of his love. So God loves us with this deep love. And that love changes us. It changes our hearts and makes us want to share that love with others. And so, Pope Francis says, you young people are brave adventurers. If you allow yourselves to discover the rich teachings of the church on love, you will discover that Christianity does not consist of a series of prohibitions which stifle our desire for happiness, but rather it's a project for life capable of captivating our hearts. I'm reminded of St. Augustine who said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. The Lord is the love of our lives the one who calls us to this deep, personal, unconditional love that only he can give us. And that captivates our hearts. And we want to share that love with others. And so Pope Francis, in his message, says, live this beatitude. Be pure of heart. And in that way, you will find your true happiness. Then, a few... Uh, before this, uh, last year, in 2014, Pope Francis was speaking to a uh, conference. It was a diocesan conference in Rome. And in his message to them, uh, he was reflecting on a passage from Jesus' last discourse to the apostles at the Last Supper, the long chapters and teaching that we get after the Last Supper in John's Gospel, chapter 13 to chapter uh, 17 and 18. And in there, Pope Francis is reflecting on the passage where Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans. And the Holy Father, reflecting on our contemporary world, says, 
how orphaned people are, how abandoned and alone people are, how people feel their lives don't have meaning. And so he says this, our children, our kids suffer from orphanhood. Young people are orphans of a sure path to follow, of a teacher whom they can trust, of ideals that warm the heart, of hopes that sustain the effort of daily living. They are orphans, but they keep alive in their heart the desire for all those things. What things again? For ideals that warm the heart, a teacher they can trust, a sure path that will lead them to happiness. Pope Francis goes on, this is the society of orphans, our world today. Let us think of this, it's important. Orphans without the memory of a family. Because for instance, the grandparents are away in a house of rest. They don't have that presence, that memory of the family. Orphans without affection today or too hasty affection. Father is tired, mother is tired, they go to sleep and the children remain orphans. So in this situation where people are growing up in a world or living in a world where they, they feel abandoned and alone and as though their lives have no meaning, Pope Francis says, Jesus comes with a great promise. I will not leave you orphans. And he says this, you are not an orphan. Jesus Christ has revealed to us that God is Father and wants to help you because he loves you. He says, our technological society multiplies infinitely the occasions of pleasure, distraction, curiosity, but it's not capable of leading people to true joy. So much comfort, so many beautiful things, but where is joy? You can see the Holy Father, a similar message to what he said this year to the young people uh, for World Youth Day. And in this context then, he says, Jesus came, says you are not orphans, you are infinitely loved by the Father, and that Jesus wants to be your brother and be close to you and be in a very intimate relationship with you. And so he says the church today is a mother that reveals to us the love of God. It's not a non-government uh, organization, an NGO, but it's, it's truly a mother. And he goes on and says, therefore, the church presents attraction. It attracts people rather than proselytizes. And it's through its tenderness that it is drawing people, meeting their needs. Remember, uh, Pope Francis talked about how the, the world is uh, almost like a hospital. And the church is meant to be a field hospital going out into the world to tend to the wounded of our world, the orphans of our world. Then Pope Francis gives us the secret to how the church can do this, how it can speak the truth with love and be a teacher that can be trusted and be that uh, presence in people's lives that sets their hearts on fire. And it comes down to the heart. Here's what he said. We must always welcome everyone with a great heart. So the church must be this mother with a universal love, welcoming people always with a big heart. But where do we receive a heart like that? Through the heart of Jesus. He says, we must have Jesus' heart, who, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That quote should sound familiar to you because we spoke about it earlier in our series of videos. It's from Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus looks out on the crowd and his heart breaks for them. His heart is moved with pity for them. Seeing the crowds, Jesus felt compassion. Pope Francis says, I like to dream of a church 
that lives the compassion of Jesus. Compassion is to suffer with, to feel what the others feel, to share in their sentiments. It is the mother church as a mother that caresses her children with compassion. A church that has a heart without boundaries, but not just the heart, also the look, the gentleness of the look of Jesus. And that makes so much sense because, you know, our faces reveal what's in our heart. If our hearts are full of anger, our faces will show that. If our hearts are sad, our faces will show that. If our hearts are filled with joy, our faces show that. And so Pope Francis says, only if our hearts are like the heart of Jesus will we, the body of Christ, be able to show to the world the gentleness, the tenderness of a mother who wants to guide her children to true happiness, to joy. This is the heart of Jesus that Pope Francis speaks about in his word, his speech to the, uh, to the diocesan conference in Rome in June of 2014. I have two more uh, documents that I want to speak about in relation to Pope Francis' recent teaching about the heart. And one of them is from February 11th, 2015 where Pope Francis on the World Day of the Sick presented a message to the world about wisdom of heart. Now, February 11th is the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, and it is now known also as the World Day of the Sick, a day when we pray for those who are ill, suffering from illness or disease, and for their caregivers, and that together they and we may find meaning in our suffering. And that's where the wisdom comes into play, wisdom of the heart. So Pope Francis says this, this wisdom, the wisdom of the heart, is no theoretical abstract knowledge, the product of reasoning. Rather, it is as St. James described in his letter, pure, peaceable, gentle, full of mercy and good fruits, without uncertainty or insincerity. Pope Francis comments, it is a way of seeing things infused by the Holy Spirit in the minds and the hearts of those who are sensitive to the sufferings of their brothers and sisters and who can see in them the image of God. This is the wisdom of the heart, not a hard heart that ignores suffering that wants to run from it, but a heart that sees the image of God, Jesus, in anyone who is suffering and immediately responds. Remember in Matthew chapter 25, last judgment scene, Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of my brothers or sisters, you do for me. Those who cared for the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, didn't recognize Jesus there, but just naturally with the compassion of their heart, responded to that suffering. It helps to be able to recognize in one who is suffering, Jesus suffering in and with that person. So he says, let us take up the prayer of the psalmist. Teach us to number our days that we may gain wisdom of heart, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, we don't have forever. Teach us to number our days aright. We're not going to live forever on this earth. And we're given this time, each precious day, each moment, in which our hearts either become more hard or become more like the heart of Jesus. Then Pope Francis talks about this wisdom of heart in several ways that, um, in a sense, are repetitive. He says, wisdom of heart means serving our brothers and sisters. He says, today, how many Christians show, not only by their words, but by lives rooted in a genuine faith, that they are eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. He calls this a great path of sanctification, that when we see sickness, disability, suffering, we reach out and care for the one in need. Wisdom of heart means first, 
serving our brothers and sisters. Secondly, he says, wisdom of heart means being with our brothers and sisters. Time spent with the sick is holy time. In other words, we don't just give a donation, but we go to the person who is sick. One of the greatest gifts we can give to someone who is suffering is to not ignore them or to be afraid to approach them because we don't know what to say, but to be with them in their suffering, even when we don't have anything to say, but to be of support to them. He says, how great a lie lurks behind certain phrases which so insist on the importance of quality of life so that they make people think that lives affected by grave illness are not worth living. You know, one of the greatest tragedies is to not suffer, but to suffer without any sense of meaning or purpose in that. And the church, through this wisdom of the heart, has a message that those who suffer have a very important role to play. They're sharing the suffering of Jesus, and they can unite their cross to the cross of Jesus. And we can help them see that. Wisdom of heart, Pope Francis goes on, means going forth from ourselves toward our brothers and sisters, you know, reaching out to them, getting beyond the walls of the church or our own family. He says, occasionally our world forgets the special value of time spent at the bedside of the sick. It's a very holy place. We meet Christ there. Then Pope Francis says, wisdom of the heart means showing solidarity with our brothers and sisters while not judging them. Charity takes time. Solidarity means being with the person in their suffering. It's kind of like the prodigal son's father who wanted his son back. And when he saw his son coming from far away, didn't wait, but ran to meet him. And the words out of his mouth are not words of judgment and reproach, but of total acceptance. There may be time for that teaching later, but now is the time to be reconciled, to welcome back the one who was sick of soul and to show him mercy. And then, once that relationship has been reestablished, then the teaching can go on. The father can help the son understand what happened, how he would was looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for happiness in all the wrong ways. And that true joy is to be found there in the father's home. So Pope Francis, in this message about the suffering and the sick for the world day of the sick, talks to us again of wisdom of heart, a wisdom that we acquire from the sacred heart of Jesus. And then we have his message for Lent 2015, in which, again, we have a focus on the heart. Using a passage from the letter of James, chapter 5, verse 8, Pope Francis reflects upon, make our hearts firm. And he goes and says this, God does not ask of us anything that he himself has not first given us. What did God give us? Well, our whole life, everything. And on the cross, Jesus offered everything for us. So he doesn't ask of us anything more than what he himself has already given. He says, God is not aloof from us. Each one of us has a place in his heart. He knows us by name. He cares for us. And he seeks us out whenever we turn away from him. He is interested in each of us. His love does not allow him to be indifferent to what happens to us. And this theme of indifference is the focus for his message for Lent in 2015. He bemoans the fact that we live in a very selfish world. He says that as long as we're comfortable and we're not experiencing any kind of inconvenience or suffering, then we tend to want to ignore suffering around us. He says, our hearts grow cold 
as long as I am relatively healthy and comfortable, I don't think about those less well off. Today, this selfish attitude of indifference has taken on global proportions. And this is where the Holy Father said during Lent, we want our hearts to be converted, transformed, to go beyond this culture or globalization of indifference, to have hearts like Jesus that go out to those in need, that are moved with pity for those who suffer. He says, God is not indifferent to our world. And God shows this through us, the body of Christ. As Jesus is the Father's love made flesh in the world, so now we, joined to Jesus through the Eucharist, the body of Christ, are God's love made flesh in the world. God is not indifferent, nor are we. Then the Holy Father, in his message for Lent, goes on and talks about this need for our hearts to be formed and transformed. He puts it this way. He said, I would like to invite everyone to live this Lent, and we could say our whole lives, as an opportunity for engaging in what Benedict XVI called a formation of the heart. A merciful heart does not mean a weak heart. Anyone who wishes to be merciful must have a strong and steadfast heart, closed to the tempter, but open to God. A heart which lets itself be pierced by the Spirit so as to bring love along the roads that lead to our brothers and sisters. Make our hearts like yours, Lord. That's what Pope Francis desires, and that's the prayer he concludes his message with. He said, let us all ask the Lord, make our hearts like yours. This is a reference to one of the phrases in the Litany of the Sacred Heart. In this way, he says, we will receive a heart which is firm, merciful, attentive, and generous. A heart which is not closed, indifferent, or prey to the globalization of indifference. With this heart then, our hearts transformed with the sacred heart of Jesus, loving with the sacred heart of Jesus, living in union with the sacred heart of Jesus then, we can build the civilization of love. We can make the world a place like the place it was intended to be. God did not intend the world to be in the state it currently is in. God wanted everyone to have enough food, everyone to be cared for, no one to be ignored, abandoned, orphaned. And we now, as members of the body of Christ, living with the heart of Jesus and loving with the heart of Jesus, have this great opportunity and challenge and obligation to build the civilization of love. This is why we can say, as we conclude this series and repeat what Pope Benedict said, that devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus is not something that is optional. Remember, we quoted this once before, that Pope Benedict, on the 50th anniversary of Pope Pius XII's encyclical on the Sacred Heart of Jesus, said that this devotion has irreplaceable importance and is indispensable for a loving relationship with God. Irreplaceable. There's no substitute. And, of course, other devotions help this devotion. As we said, divine mercy devotion is part of sacred heart devotion. It's a way that we exhibit our love for the heart of Jesus and knowledge of his love and mercy for us. And it's a way that we extend that mercy into the world and build the civilization of love. But it's all focused on Jesus and the Eucharist. And this devotion is indispensable for a living relationship. In other words, that it's not just a matter of saying a few prayers or consecrating one's family and then going on our different ways, but it's a way of living our lives in union with the heart of Jesus, with these transformed hearts, a living relationship one day at a time. This is the key 
to Christian living. All the way to heaven is heaven. And we're here on earth on a journey to the kingdom of heaven where the civilization of love will be fulfilled totally and it will be complete. So along the journey, we help one another. Given the heart of Jesus, beating with and within ours, we love with the sacred heart of Jesus. Thank you for being part of our series. I'm glad to have had this opportunity to go a little deeper into our book and now with this final summary chapter to go a little further, bringing to your attention some of the things that Pope Francis has said about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And so, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.